Welcome to the Follow the Leaders podcast, where we get a glimpse into the minds and lives of exceptional leaders and hear about their experiences, insights, and strategies for success. On today's episode, we'll hear from one heart-centered, effective leader and hear about their wisdom and perspective. So get ready to follow along. Welcome back to the podcast. I have a feeling that talking with my guest today is going to be a little dangerous for me. I absolutely love my work, but I would be lying if I didn't admit that going to law school has always been a little bit of a temptation. And I think that recording this episode may reignite some of that internal dialogue. But in all seriousness, I'm going to stick with my decision to stay on my career path and just have intriguing conversations with actual experts in the field like I'm doing today. My guest today is Scott Reeb. Scott is known as America's legal coach and is a Zig Ziglar small business lawyer who brings over 20 years of legal experience to entrepreneurs. Known for his access plan legal service, he aims to make legal advice accessible and affordable, challenging the idea that it has to be intimidating. As a Ziglar Legacy Certified Trainer, Scott helps business owners shatterproof their ventures, sharing insights in his podcast and his brand new book, The Shatterproof Entrepreneur. He advocates treating lawyers like primary care doctors, emphasizing proactive legal support for long-term business success. Congratulations on all of your success and impact, Scott, and welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Jamie. I'm excited to be here. So our listeners are leaders and entrepreneurs who I know will benefit from hearing your advice and learning from you. And I always like to start by asking my guests about their current work. So can you tell us what your career is looking like these days in addition to promoting your new book? Yeah. And as I heard that intro, I'm getting awfully close to 30 years of experience as a lawyer. Okay. And yeah, it's it's hard to believe time really flies. But I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm living the dream. I have my own law firm and I've had it for 18 years, uh, litigated for a long time. And now I do very, very little of that. And I get to spend my time helping entrepreneurs grow and protect their business through my law firm and our subscription model. And then also through Shatterproof Solutions uh, and doing uh, coaching, running events. And so we also help through our Shatterproof Entrepreneur Podcast. But I mean, like I said, I live a really good life. It's been a long time coming. I guess I'm a 27-year overnight success. Uh, but it's, uh, <laughs> the best kind, right? Yeah, it's been a journey. But yeah, I believe that the best vehicle to achieve your life goals and dreams is a small business. And so I get to be a part of that every day. Uh, with people all over the country and around the world. And so it's it's pretty amazing. Okay, so let's start there. So why do you say that that is the best way to achieve your dreams? I mean, obviously, I'm happy to hear that. But why is that where you would love to see more people? Yeah, I mean, partly because that's how I'm doing it, right? So I do have some bias. But I've <laughs> seen too many people put their faith in corporate jobs and get to year 25 and suddenly they're laid off. And I've seen it in my family. I saw my dad go through that they get to the end of what they think is towards the end of a career and suddenly it's pulled out from under them mm-hmm. and they were so close to, to reaching the success they wanted. And then it's, it's all over and they're wrecked. And as a small business owner, I don't have that problem. I mean, I, I am my own boss and my clients and customers are my bosses, I guess, and they can fire me whenever <laughs> they want to. But I've, I've learned skills in getting to this point that if I wanted to start something else and we are starting other things, that I could create revenue and not be dependent on someone else to do that. And I've, I've got two boys, 21 and 25. And my 25-year-old Jake, he got laid off from his first sales job. He was newly married, got laid off. And I'm like, oh, gee, I'd be freaking out. And I talked to him and he's like, no, dad, it's fine. You've taught me how to fish. And so I'll be fine. I'll, I'll find a way to make money. And so it's just the entrepreneurial mindset makes it easier to go get your dream. And Many people like us are eager to help them. As an employee, there's not a whole lot of people that are really eager to help you succeed. If you serve their company well, that you may rise through the ranks, but there's not people just lining up to help you. There's, there's information everywhere. There's community among small business owners, and everyone's trying to help everyone get better. And I just think it's a great life. And if, if you have a dream, I'm not saying you can't achieve it through a job, but it's much easier to do as a small business owner or entrepreneur with multiple streams of 
income. I love to hear the part about your son because I had a similar, my, my kids are a little bit younger, but they're teenagers. And I was just having this discussion with my middle child, my son the other day. And he said something like, why would someone do that for money or something like that? And I like add as a side job. And I was like, uh -huh. well, because most people, if you just have a job, like you don't get to decide how much money you make you as a business owner, you know, he watches me and his dad has some autonomy over his work. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, you see two parents who, if we want to make more money, we just start new projects. We go do new things. But that isn't the case if someone has already capped your salary at a certain amount. So it, it's a completely different, like, it was a nice outside the fishbowl moment for me, speaking of fish, to say like, oh, this is his experience yeah. is watching two parents, you know, who just go, you want to make more money? You just go do more things. So, oh, I, so I really love that. Yeah. It turns out money does grow on trees. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. You can just like start something new and you might be working a ton to get there and you're never going to work as hard as a job as you will on your own business, but nope. it can can pay off. So you mentioned your law practice. I am curious if you can share how you got to the point where you are now. Obviously, law school was a part of that, but from that point, how did you get to the point that you are right now? Yeah. And you mentioned that you've had that perpetual kind of a dream about being a law student and Law school was great. It really was probably the best three years of, of my life. We, we were married and poor, but it was a really, really good time. If you ever worked going back to school, it's much better if you can do it full time. And I was able to, we had a, my wife was a teacher. She, so she, she made $600 every two weeks and we paid our bills and I was able to be a student and it was pretty great. But I've convinced several young people over the last two decades to not go to law school. Okay. There's reasons to go. But a lot of people have come to work for me to check out the career and they've gone gone the other direction. They found their passion somewhere else and and it's good. But I ended up here as an entrepreneur. I was uh, graduated from college in 91 and the economy was a wreck. There really weren't jobs. My dream, and I, I still kind of is, I, I wanted to be an advertising executive. And my best friend in business school did make that route. And he's an ad exec in Chicago uh, in the food industry. I I came back to, to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I grew up, and tried to find marketing jobs, and there really weren't any. They were all sales jobs. And so they wanted you to sell copiers or insurance, and I ended up in the, the telecom industry, and I didn't get an actual job. I got uh, offered a, a gig as an authorized agent for AT&T. Got to go through their sales training, which was amazing, and they paid me to do that. And then once I was through the sales training, I was 100% commission sales. I had the aftermarket for Tulsa, Oklahoma. Anyone that had an AT&T phone system and wanted to add anything to it, it went through me. And it was, it was a really nice job. And I got to do it from my dining room table if I wanted to. I could go to their office and they had a place where I could kind of a shared space if I needed to print stuff or do stuff I could. But I mostly worked from my home and was out seeing customers. And I figured out in their computer system, there was a way to print off new contracts for expiring maintenance agreements. Because back then, phone systems were expensive. It's not like we have it today where you can just get a, a VoIP system and pay 35 bucks a month. It was tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes for bigger businesses. So you would get these maintenance contracts so that they could keep up their phones. They would last for decades. Well, those would expire. And so I would send out contracts in the mail. Half of them would come back signed and ready to go. They were paying me on annualized pre premium for those basically insurance policies. And I would just keep following up. I'd end up with about 75% of them coming back. And every month I was doing this, printing on my dot matrix printer at the house, sending it with a nice sales letter and money was coming in. And at, we were 23 years old and we thought this was amazing. And then I got a new general manager at the general business systems that loved my system and loved what I was doing so much that she took it away from me and gave it to a minimum wage employee and sent me to the sticks. If anyone ever sends you to the sticks, the sticks is code for they have no technology. And so they sent me there to die. And I did what any normal person would do. I applied for law school and went back and retooled. <laughs> Okay. A, yeah, I had always considered it like as a really cool career. I can remember in career day, I can remember the guy coming in in like seventh grade and talking about his law practice. And you know, I grew up in a small town and he was very respected. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And so it was kind of always there, but I kind of lost interest in it as I got into business school. 
And I might even did a couple of pre-law classes, visited a couple of law schools, but it's just, I just didn't have the passion for it then. So I didn't do it. But at the point in time where I, I need, I really needed to, to make something happen because I didn't want to be unemployed again. I tried that. That wasn't fun. And the market just ha- wasn't improving rapidly. I needed to retool. So that really either meant getting an MBA or law school and law school just was more appealing to me. I really was interested in doing trial work. So I went that route and it's ended up being a great decision. Once I, you know, once I got through law school, was a lawyer, worked here in Texas for now almost 27 years. It's been a really cool journey. I've done a lot of fun things, but I, I wouldn't have ever pictured this back when I was 23 starting law school. All right. That's so interesting. You really had that entrepreneurial mindset right from the get-go. And yeah, it is it is tempting to go back. I mean, there have been these points in my career where I've thought, okay, well, now I need to go and get this degree or this certification. And then I end up sort of, like you're saying, being talked out of it. <laughs> so so I'm happy to hear that. That's really interesting. So just to clarify, so your practice right now is your law practice. And then you also have just written a book, The Shatterproof Entrepreneur. Are you also doing any direct one-on-one work or what does that look like? Yeah. So we have a program called the Access Plan at Reeb Law, where we have a subscription model legal consulting plan to help business owners that are from launch mode to what I call guardian mode, where we've got a, a business that's already scaling. Now we're playing on, you know, what does our legacy look like? How do we pass this on to the next generation? If something happens to one of the owners, what happens? So dealing with those issues. But then it's just giving them on-demand access. I like to say having the right information at the right time is often the difference between success and failure. And so in 2012, I hired my first coach to help me create this on-demand system. And so I sell that. And then I do the strategy work with clients on a daily basis. And then I have a team that does whatever legal work needs to be done behind the scenes. Occasionally, I'll jump in on a project if it's interesting to me, or if there's a a real time crunch and I know I can do it faster Then occasionally I will still jump in and do that. And then I'm other times I'm out speaking. I was in Atlanta at EdgeCon 10 days ago. I've got a couple of things coming up in the next couple of months because I can have much more influence and effect if I'm going one to many, uh, as opposed to uh, just me over a zoom call with a business owner. I love doing that, but it's just not as, as influential as I can be like over with your podcast or with my podcast where Hundreds of and thousands of people can listen to me at one time or over time, and then our that effect can be bigger. We're also planning our own Shatterproof Solutions live events. There'll be one first one this summer, and oh, then cool. creating an inner circle mastermind group where I can bring my friends who are experts in lots of different things into a small group of people that I'm that I, a pack I'm running with, so that they can learn different things. Like how does how does real estate investment work? If you want to do long term rents, if you want to do flips, how does that work? If you want to do short-term rental, what's, what are the ins and outs of that? Because as small business owners, a lot of us get in a trap where we're, we're just so focused on this one thing that we do that we don't have any diversification. And that can be kind of dangerous because the economy could shift on you and suddenly the thing that you've been selling is no longer viable. And so you need to have some other things. And so I want my, my business owners to know here's some other things that you can do to, to take the income you make from your regular business and and maybe and increase it and turn that into a, a, a legacy. And so that's, that's what I do on a, you know, on a daily basis. Yeah. I think we all learned that a few years ago, now with four years ago in COVID when suddenly the things that we are go to, some, some of our businesses were designed in a way that it worked perfectly to yep. switch to online, but many of us had to pivot and shift and think, okay, well, how else can we deliver the things that matter to us, the things that we've been working on, the investment we've made into our companies? Right. So you talk a lot about the importance of eliminating signer's remorse. And so I'm curious, what do you mean by that? And where should people start? Yeah. I mean, everyone has signed a contract that they later regretted, Mm -hmm. either immediately or when they figured out there was something in it that they didn't understand, or there was something that's missing from the contract. And so I created a real simple system of eight questions that you can go through to make sure that the contract has the, the main things that every contract should have and that you're not going to be disappointed with the results of it. You know, it's not, this isn't a hundred percent guarantee, but it gets you really close without a lawyer. The best thing to do is go through these questions, put together your draft agreement, and then bring it to your business lawyer. You've saved a lot of time. 
for them. And then they can turn around a really quality legal agreement that has all the right legal mumbo jumbo in it that you might not know how to, to do, right? A lot of us are really good at what we do. And then we get out of our lane and try to do this other stuff. And then it gets like, it's, it's almost right. And almost right doesn't work in, in most things. Like it's really not good right. in brain surgery. Almost right's not good. Uh, <laughs> it's, really the, it's, it's really the same in legal work. You want it right. You don't want it almost right. So going through these questions isn't a substitute, but it can really help you. Because in today's world, we're making deals fast. You know, maybe we're on mm -hmm. a Zoom call. We're talking about a deal and then it needs to happen quickly. Well, how do you turn that into an agreement? And this is how you do it is you just start asking questions. And the first question that you should always ask is why am I doing this contract? What's the purpose of it? What do I want to achieve from it? And you shouldn't just think about it. You should actually write it down. You can type it if you want to, but you need to have it in writing so you can see it, read it. Does that make sense? Do I want to do it? And if this document that you're going to create, or if you're reviewing one, doesn't achieve that purpose, kill the deal, move on, do something else. Don't do it. This next thing you would do if you're reviewing an agreement, for instance, is that you would highlight all the dates. So you go through and make sure every date in that agreement is highlighted. And then you ask yourself, can I live with these dates? Do they work for me? Can I meet any deadlines that I have with these dates? And am I okay if they live by those dates? If there's a problem with dates, then you need to change the dates or again, kill the deal. The next thing you highlight is all the money. So anywhere it talks about money, and I would use different color highlighters, you go through and highlight all the money. Now, does the money match up to what you had talked about on your Zoom call or wh wh wherever you had that conversation You're with your understanding of this deal? If the money is wrong, either renegotiate the money and get it changed or you don't sign the agreement, right? That's re really simple. The next thing that you want to do is go through and figure out what are the things I have to do under this agreement, right? Because most contracts, you might be paying some money or receiving some money, but you're also doing something. You're doing something physical or you're providing a service. So what am I supposed to do? What, what are those obligations? And you want to mark those some way, highlight them, underline them, but so you can see them. And then again, can you do that? Do you want to do that to get to, to, get to the purpose of this contract? And if you don't, then don't do the deal. And the other four questions are very similar. And anyone that would want to have the rest of those questions can come to my website. We'll create a, a, a special page just for this. And so it'll be our reblaw.com forward slash Jamie. And if you go to that okay. site, you can download the ebook that walks you through all of those questions so that you can then set that beside a contract and make sure that you are, are never going to have signer's remorse. Awesome. Okay. Thank you for that offer. So I have a question. Like you mentioned, you know, you're on a Zoom call, you're making a plan. This is something obviously when you're a business owner, you're doing this all the time. There are the big ones where it's just obvious you're going to need to sit down and write it out. It's very clear. You're signing yeah. a long-term agreement. Everybody's on the same page, but there are so many, you know, smaller things with, that seem small in the moment, but in reality, they do make a big difference if people aren't on the same page from the beginning. And so mm -hmm. I'm really curious as we're just moving through our day-to-day -day lives as entrepreneurs, how do you balance wanting to preempt every potential conflict with a clear plan and all the things that you're talking about, which is obviously like really important, but how do you balance that with just wanting to keep conversations going and moving forward and getting on people's timelines so that business can happen? You know, I, I'm, I know that you also talk about it being more of an art than a science, but I'm just curious, how are people supposed to navigate that? Yeah, right. It's the, it's, it's a balancing act and it's, it is an art. It's the art of documenting the deal and it becomes mm -hmm. more important to document the deal, the more successful you are. So early on when you have nothing to lose, it may be less important to have all those deals exactly documented. You'd rather just get the sale. And I totally get that. Not that it's still not important, but I get it. But as you become more successful, your legal systems and structures should get tighter and you should be able to get signed agreements. Signed agreements are what keep friends, friends and honest people honest. If you don't have them, here's the problem you run into is that someone ends up getting called a liar. And I don't think I've ever done business with anyone after they've called me a liar. It's hard to, to recover from that, which is totally mm -hmm. different from, I think, 
I think you're misremembering. Let's go look at the written agreement and see what it says. If you go do that, then you haven't accused them of anything. Everyone can misremember. But if we go look at the written document and then we can refresh our memory and go, oh, yeah, that's what it says. OK, that's what we'll do. But if you don't have mm -hmm. something to go tag, then you're stuck with having to argue that they just they're they're wrong. And mm -hmm. business is all about relationships. It's not about the deal. It's all about the next deal and the relationships in the future and the lifetime value of those relationships. So if they're important to you, then you have to document them. But you can do that in using the same method we were talking about when reviewing a contract. You ask those questions on your Zoom call, you type them into bullet points, send them over in an email or a text and say, are these the deal points that, that you believe we're agreeing to? And if you've got all these of the eight points, you've got a written, if they say yes, it's unconditional yes, that's a, that's a signed agreement. That's a digital contract that you could enforce. Again, it's not the best, but you still have something you can go back to and say, no, we said that it was going to. Everything was going to be due on October 31st, not October 21st. And if you can do that, it, it can save the relationship. And so by doing that simple step, you can document things through you know, text and email. SMS, much easier to do. And again, I think that's a first step. The second step should be, here's the deal points, Mr. or Mrs. Attorney. Throw this into the legal mumbo jumbo and we'll get it signed. But you've still moved the ball forward, right? Because whoever you're talking to, now we both know that we're on the same page. And so now we're going to get a formal contract that I can compare to the deal points and they're going to match up. If they don't match up, then someone's got an integrity problem. But if they do match up, then we can move forward quickly and, and do our deal. And so that would be my advice is, is learn that, learn how to do that. The art of documenting the deals, not just the art of doing deals. Well, I really love that. And I, I, I'm glad you mentioned about the friendships. You know, obviously in small business, a lot of times we are starting something with a friend or an acquaintance or someone we knew from a previous, you know, a, another parent at the school, whatever it is. Most of my work programs that I do are collaborations with other people. You know, I own my mm -hmm. own business. I'm a single owner company, but I do a lot of collaborations with other people. And throughout the time I started, since I started my business almost 12 years ago, I've gotten way more confident, even in those friend to friend situations of saying, okay, hey, let's just like get it out on paper just so that we can make sure we're both on the same page. And like you mentioned, the, obviously the best case scenario is going to an attorney, but I find that like having those those pause points to discuss the kind of like, yeah, who's bringing what in, what's being exchanged, <laughs> how do we get out of this, all of that up front eliminates the need for any further anything. You know, we, we're, we're getting those things out in front. I guess one follow up question is what happens when you're starting a project, but you don't know what all of the details are going to be, you know, who you want to work with you know, generally the direction you want to go, but there's going to be a lot that's figured out along the way. Do you document that? Do you set a time in the future that you're going to return when the details are hammered out? I guess, is there, is there any science to this or is it all just art as you go? Yeah, I think it's art. So I think you document what you can. So what is the goal? What are we trying to achieve? And get as many bullet points as you can for where we are now, and then agree to that. And then when you move get the project further, like when you've defined the project, then come back and say, okay, now we've, now we've fully defined the project. We know what the scope is. Now here's the full scope and here's the agreement. And the, the, the first thing may not be enforceable. Like you might not be able to take it into court and do anything with it. But again, it's, it's, that's, no one wants to be in court. Court's only good for, for trial lawyers. No one else. Right. And so you, it, the idea is to, to keep the relationships and so by just document what you can so you can go tag that base. And then as you get more, more of the framework and scope in mind that add to add to the bullet points and you should eventually get to a written agreement. But like you said, it's more important with friends than with strangers. And I do tons of things with, with friends. Sometimes they were friends before we did, did the deal. And sometimes we become friends through the deals and then there's more deals. Totally. And so you, it's just so important to have those really crystal clear so that if there's an exit and I've, I've had to use those before where, especially being a lawyer, there's sometimes where we have conflicts of interest and when working with friends that comes up where it's like, Hey, I'm this person's lawyer. I know that you've got some deals with them. I can be your lawyer, but if you ever have a conflict with them, I, it's in writing that that I no longer am your lawyer and I'm their lawyer. And if we have that really clear, 
everyone's fine. But if it's not, then not only am I getting in trouble, but the relationships all go south. So it's just, it's just good. If to, to be a good human being, you want clarity in everything you're doing. And the best way to do that's in writing. And like I said, texts and emails can work, but get a lawyer. Okay. Bottom line, get a lawyer. All right. So your book, The Shatterproof Entrepreneur is newly out. So I am very eager to read it. It's it's there. We'll, we'll, we'll grab a little screen grab of that and share that online. And we'll, of course, link it in the show notes, but I haven't read it yet. So can you tell us what can we expect to find in this book and, and who is the best person to read it? Yeah. So if you're an entrepreneur and already have a business, this book's perfect for you. If you're considering starting a business, read this book and you may go, mm, I don't want to do all that. And that's okay. It's not for everyone. As much as I love it, I have to admit it's not not for everyone. But in this book, we go through the six phases of creating a shatterproof business. And to me, a shatterproof business is a business that will bend and not break. We talked earlier about that I believe that small business is the best vehicle to achieve your life goals and dreams. Vehicles have these things called windshields. And those windshields are made out of shatterproof glass. And they're made out of that so you can have good vision and protection. And so we want to build our businesses in that same way. It's that shatterproof glass that's in our cars. It was in gas masks and in the world wars to protect you. And so things hit your car windshield. If I don't know where it, what it's like where you live in Wisconsin, but where I live in Texas, every time you go on the highway, you have rocks hitting your cars. They're flying everywhere. Okay. And I've never had one go through my windshield and hit me in the face. They mark my windshield. Sometimes it cracks it, but I can carry on with my, my journey. And then when I'm done with that, this journey, I can pull over, call the glass company, and they fix it or they replace it. But it never, it never knocks me off the road. And with business, if you go through these six phases, from, from the first phase is getting your foundation right, which is everything from leadership, you know, vision, mission, core values, to having the right legal entity structure. But if you do these six phases, you're going to have a business that will stand the test of time, will stand up to things like the pandemic that we all dealt with in 2020, because you've put the work in, you've put the right legal systems and business structures in place so that you can survive. And then you're building what I call an unbreakable business legacy. I love it. Does it sort of take you through the process? Yeah. And you could do some of it in different order. It wouldn't have to be phase one, two, three. You could, you could skip around a little bit, but once you get the, the foundation set, then you've got to create your brand, you know, brand identity and protection. You know, if you're trying to sell, you've got, you've got to know who you are, what you're selling, who you're selling to. And I really have your brand identified, but if you really want to have success, you have to own that brand and be able to dominate it. And then intellectual property rights come in. And so you've got to be able to do all that right. And, and I would say, suggest that you get all that stuff done, but then you also have to create a marketing system because if you don't have a system for turning suspects to prospects and prospects into customers, you're not going to make it. I mean, you might get some customers or clients, but eventually you're, you're going to hit a business cycle that you have no business if you don't have a, a marketing system. And so then once you get your marketing systems, now you got people coming to your business. Now what's our sales system? How do we take that prospect and convert them into uh, a, a client? And then you have to have an onboarding system, right? So that you can take this new client and turn them into a raving fan so that they keep coming back and you have lifetime value. And that's just an example of some of the stuff that's in the book. But you know, I my journey really started as going from being a lawyer to being a entrepreneur and business owner when I read Michael Gerber's The E-Myth Revisited. And I'm not saying that my book is anything like Michael's, but that started my journey. And I really think this book can kind of open some people's eyes to some things that they just are overlooking, right? They've had this entrepreneurial seizure mm -hmm. and they, they're skipping some steps. And if you, if you <laughs> check all the boxes in these phases, then you won't have skipped any major steps. And that leads you to you know, that unbreakable business. Well, I love that you're offering people so many resources. One part of my work is that I support moms who want to start businesses. That's that's an area that I focus a lot of my work. And, you know, my caveat to them is I am not a lawyer, you know. And so I really love that you're offering resources that if somebody, you know, when people are starting businesses, and especially with my clientele that are also growing their families when they're also growing their mm -hmm. businesses, you know, time and resources 
may be tight. They have big goals. They want to create income for their family that fits into their life, but they're not going to go and hire a powerhouse attorney team right from the beginning and a whole marketing strategist and all these things. And so it sounds like the work you're doing and the work that I'm doing is along the same lines to support them right where they're at in in helpful, strategic, sound ways without needing the full, you know, big business approach with investors and all of that. And so I really love, and I'm excited to check out the resources that you're offering because it seems like it's a really nice compliment to what I'm doing and something that my clients, my mentorship clients really need. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Yeah, it really does. And that's why like we've built the access plan. I mean, you can be an access member in the launch level for less than 5,000 a year. So and I've I've been advised by mentors and coaches that hey you're not charging enough you need to raise that price and I just I I stood firm that I have to have a spot where where new entrepreneurs can get access to that information otherwise I'm leaving out I mean if my mission is to help help as many business owners as possible grow and protect their businesses I've got to have this place where they can actually get the help and so I'm really passionate about it and so we really try to keep the plans affordable so that you can't use that excuse of I don't have money. So don't if you need help, reach out. We'll figure out how to help you. Don't let money get in the way. Because you're you'll end up spinning over to pick up nickels and skipping dollar bills. There's a lot of things out there that you just especially in our world where you can start these side hustles so quickly that you can be creating risk that puts your whole family mm-hmm. in jeopardy and have no idea. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I encourage you to do it. Open your open these businesses, but as soon as it's more than a hobby. You've got to get the legal protection in place. And this book will show you kind of where those holes are and where, how you need to do it. Well, that's wonderful. I'm, I'm really excited to check that out. One quick question. Does it matter what state you're in to work with your, that access plan? Because I know that the laws vary state to state. Yeah, it definitely does. And so it's a legal consulting plan and we work with people all over the country. Occasionally, we'll have to get lawyers, local lawyers to do parts of what they need because it's so state specific. But a lot of what we do is create these legal structures and systems that are what I call the low-hanging fruit of law. It's like everyone needs this. It's kind of the same everywhere, and people don't have it. They don't have anything. And so you know, it's like get the right LLC structure. If you need one or two or three, let's get those set up right and, and get them working right with your accountant so you have tax efficiency. It's that kind of stuff that we can kind of help everyone with. And then even more so when, when you're working with me on a mastermind level, where we're talking about bigger picture and strategy. And, but if we need something in, like in court or an administrative process, then we make sure there's a local lawyer there to, to help you and we manage the process. Okay, that's wonderful. All right, if I have some more rapid fire questions as we wrap up here that are zooming out a little bit. Do any examples come to mind of how you gravitated towards leadership roles as a child? You know, I, I, don't, re- I don't remember this, but my mom tells me that I used to march kids around the neighborhood carrying ladders. So I don't, I don't know why I <laughs> did that. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what we were doing. But she said I, I was all, <laughs> okay. I was always in charge. So I guess, I guess it's just inside of me. I, I will say that I think law school changed my personality quite a bit. I used to be hmm. a lot more outgoing, and I sent, tend to sit back a lot more and listen, and then interject when I know for sure I know what I'm talking about. And a lot of times. I think we mistake people that are outgoing and dominating conversation as leaders when a lot of times it's the quieter person in the room that really is has those stronger leadership skills. So do you think that that's a good thing that it changed your personality in that way? Probably. Yeah, it there's some negatives to it for sure. And that's one reason I discourage some people from going to law school is that the process of becoming a lawyer is different than becoming almost anything else. And you walk into those classrooms and you've read case after case, and then they call on you and grill you. And you, you learn how to, like, how, to, how to disappear in the crowd so that you don't get called on mm. uh, until you know what you're doing. And so it just, it just does change you. And also it's very competitive. It's not like the, we talked about earlier where the entrepreneurial world, we're all trying to help each other. And in law school, no one's trying to help you. Everyone is trying to beat you. And so it's, it, it just, you, it changes the way you see things and interact with people. And I'm sure some of that I've kind of moved away from, but I definitely, I ask better questions and I listen a lot more than I talk. Well, I think that I'm not supposed to ask a follow-up question on a rapid fire question, but I'm, I'm curious if you think that part of it is also that the industry, the field of law is really about 
the risks. And as an entrepreneur, we we have to be willing to take risks. And I feel like from what I know about the law field, there's a lot of knowing where the potholes are and, and mm -hmm. really looking to avoid risk. And so I'm wondering if you think that that's a balancing act that the law field sort of sometimes works against the business field. Yeah, it does. I think most lawyers are risk averse and are a lot of them are what we call, I call deal killers. There's never, the, the deal is never good enough. It's never safe enough and you shouldn't do it. And they can't be entrepreneurs, but there are some of us who, who seem to be able to fight through it and uh, have enough optimism in us that we can find a way to cover enough of the risk to move forward. And so I've, I've been able to conquer that. Okay. Well, well, well done because that's, that is something that I see even in the discussions that, that, you know, I call myself fake lawyer, you know, I'm like the, those things I'm like, okay, but you got to be careful of this and this and this. And sometimes people are like, okay, it's going to be fine. I'm like, no, I've seen it not be fine. And I'm not even a lawyer. Yeah. I can see how that's, that's an ongoing battle. All right. Is there one tool or strategy that you use for staying organized and effective, whether that's like a paper tool or a tech tool? I use Asana to organize all of my projects and, and, and I take all of my notes in Evernote. So I never, I never lose a, a note. And the combination of those two keeps me organized. I am not an organized person without those things. Okay. All right. Awesome. All right. My last question for you today is if you had a day off, completely off, you could accomplish nothing in your asana. You could take no notes. You could accomplish nothing for work. What is one activity you would do and one place you'd go to have something to eat? I would go ride horses. What I would do by eating, that's tough. I would probably, yeah, I would probably go to Texas Roadhouse and have a, a T-bone steak. Okay. All right. Well, I'll be wishing that day for you sometime soon. Thank you so much, Scott, for joining me today. I really enjoyed our chat. I'm excited to check out all of your resources. Where else can people find you and your podcast and all of your resources? Yeah. So you can find me on Instagram at the Scott Reeb. We're dropping reels almost every day with legal tips like we've had today. And then you can find the Shatterproof Entrepreneur everywhere you find podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere. Just type in the Shatterproof Entrepreneur and it will come up. And then you can get the book on Amazon. And if you're listening, I'd love you to get the book because I think it'd be great for you. And I'd really appreciate it if you leave a review so that other people can see what you got out of it. Awesome. We will definitely link that. I will definitely be getting the book. Thank you again for joining me and to all the listeners. Thank you for following along. We'll be back next time with another inspiring interview. Follow the Leaders is produced by Lit Path Studios and music is by Shane Ivers. You can hear more about this show and all the other podcasts at Litpath Studios by going to www.litpathstudios.com.